All right, hi yearbook and welcome to your flipped classroom lesson on yearbook terms. This will be for your final for fall 2019. So let's talk a little bit about how to use this PowerPoint. Um, first of all, there's four different sections, photography, design, um, yearbook organization, and then also um, interviewing and copy. So use this video and the markers, those are gonna be added in the description part of the YouTube video to take you to the spots that you might need to learn a little bit more about. And then also if you are a staffer, you're new to yearbook or a fairly new editor, um, I think that this is really gonna help you so that as you move up in yearbook and you become um, more involved, that way you can start using these a little bit more frequently and also start understanding how your book is structured. Um, that way you can start planning and organizing and checking out um, how you would want a yearbook to look as well. Keep in mind that this does not cover all terms that we use. For example, I don't mention things like the photo calendar or um, selling ads or um, different documents that we might use when we're selling ads um, and different ways that we might go about um, talking to people and doing interviewing. But that doesn't mean that they're not important. Um, I'm just saying that this is the stuff that we tend to see and use on a very daily basis. And so I think it's really important that you actually um, know what these mean. Um, so when a staffer or editor has any questions, you can easily answer and intend to help them out, okay? So let's get started with photography. A lot of these terms you have already seen in the photography lesson that I've done earlier this year. You've also probably received help from some of our photo editors as well, which is great. Um, but if you don't know what some of these terms are, and I might mention them to you when um, working in your photo credits, uh, this is what I mean. So let's start with the depth of field, okay? So depth of field um, basically is the nearest and furthest objects in the image that appear in focus. There's three factors that influence the depth of field. That's your aperture, the focal length of your lens, and also the distance between the camera and your focal point. So if this is our focal point right here, we're taking a look at this lone wolf. We can see we have a very narrow depth of field. That means everything behind this wolf um, even though you're taking a picture of the wolf, you're going to see these trees and the mountain, but they're going to be very blurry. So it's going to look like this has the sharpest details in the image. Now, when you have a large depth of field, your focal point will still be this wolf, and you should still try to focus on this, but you're also going to see details in the trees and maybe the mountain behind it. Um, we can see this as well when we're taking photos for yearbook where maybe we're also seeing stuff behind the person that we really don't want to get a lot of details of but we still have them so that means you're going to have to change your depth of field which happens in your aperture so smaller apertures which are higher numbered f-stops like an f-16 or f-22 tend to have a higher depth of field which makes it a really sharp image but a lower aperture, like an f2 or 2.8, have a lower depth of field, which makes it less of a sharp image, okay? So if we take a look at this photo right here, our f28 allows us to see this one lone battery, and everything else behind it is pretty blurry. When we get into an f16 f-stop, this is pretty high. Um, we're gonna see that these two are in focus, but this third one is not. And lastly, when we get to a really high f-stop, like an f32, which you might not even be able to get to on these cameras, we see that all three of these are in focus. Now, what's very trending right now is to just have um, this kind of narrow depth of field where we don't really see what's going on. We um, obviously know these are batteries, but we don't see the fine details like we do kind of here and here. So moving into the rule of thirds, when we're taking a photo, we need to keep in mind this rule of thirds. So if you're looking through your viewfinder in your camera, pretend that you're dividing up that, um, that whatever you are photographing into these lines right here. So the rule of thirds, one, two, three, and then one, two, three. So three columns, three rows, and whatever your subject is, you're trying to get their face, especially their eyes, right in the center, like right here. Not in the center of the view, 
but on these lines. We try to center them up on these lines. And the idea is that this is generating tension, energy, and a lot more interest in the photo. We have all this space over here for her eyes to look into. But if her face was on this side of the photo and she was also looking towards the left, um, that would be cropping off kind of the, the space where she needs to look. So we kind of want to keep this space and whatever their gaze is, we want to keep some space to allow for that eye room. So when we're also doing uh, photography, we need to keep in mind lighting um, and that a properly exposed image has adequate details in the dark and in the light areas. Okay. Um, there's tons of different lighting. There's studio light, there's harsh light, there's soft light, there's um, direct light, there's backlighting, there's side lighting, there's all different kinds of lighting that you can do. Um, but what we tend to want to do is soft lighting. We see that a lot in studio, um, in studio lighting, where basically we're able to kind of block off some of the more harsh lights that would give her shadows in her face and in her hair and also behind her as well. Um, now, not to say that harsh light doesn't look good, and obviously we need harsh light when we're photographing sports and especially things like baseball and softball and tennis, um, but soft light is preferred, especially when we're taking these profile pictures. So let's talk about the three things we're gonna need for a good exposure. Shutter speed is our first one. Shutter speed is half the next slower shutter speed, which means it's letting in half as much light and twice the next faster shutter speed, which is letting in twice as much light, okay? So a fast shutter speed, if we're looking at something that is in motion, like a hummingbird, a really fast shutter speed will be able to capture the wings um, and not see them in the flurry, okay? Um, a medium one would probably you'd still see some of the details of the wings, but um, it's definitely, you can see them flapping. And then if we're capturing a hummingbird in a slow shutter speed, um, we might see the body of the hummingbird, but definitely not the wings because they're moving too fast. So keep in mind that when you're doing sports photography, that when we're looking at someone who's about to make a touchdown, they're running across the field, we're going to want a nice fast shutter speed so we can be able to capture that movement really well. But if we have a slow shutter speed, we're not going to see that fast um, action happening or that fast tackle or the touchdown. Instead, we're going to have a really fuzzy photo. It's not going to look good. ISO comes to play when you're talking about sensitivity of the sensor to light, okay? Um, basically, if you have a low ISO, your photo is going to come out a little bit darker. If you have a higher ISO, your photo is going to come out a little bit lighter. We might not see as many details, especially as we do in this one, but the whole subject of the photo is definitely lighter. So the thing about ISO is that uh, they can result in noisier or grainier, I've definitely said this on your photo credits, um, and also lower quality images. Photos that are really grainy don't look good, they look almost pixelated. Um, but if you take a look here in ISO of 200, this is still really good exposure. It's definitely not underexposed. Yes, it's darker than an ISO of 1600, but the 200 has really good details and you could easily lighten this up in Photoshop if you needed to. The 400 is not too bad, but we're starting to lose details right here in the cup. And then an 800 or 1600, um, especially when we have too much light coming into this, it just makes it so, so that we're losing details and it's a bit too grainy. Backlighting is a type of a lighting that you can do. We actually saw this in a lot of our divider pages from last year in yearbook. For example, um, this was Sarita um, and she was in a play last year and this was um, light was coming and hitting her from the back and also from the side right here made for a really beautifully lit photo um, so just kind of keep that in mind that backlighting is when the light is coming from the back of a person let's move into design terms these are things that we're going to see on the spread when we're laying out our yearbook spreads 
So let's start with our caption. A caption is the description meant to accompany a photograph in the publication. It's also used interchangeably with the term cut line. If you've taken my easing class, we've talked both about um, the history of the cut line and of the caption and how they're both now used pretty interchangeably. Photo credit is a courtesy given to the photographer of the photograph, and we usually, usually see the photo credit right after the caption. For example, we have this photo, and here's our caption, anti-government protesters unload tires that they would burn to block a highway in, oh, I'm going to say this wrong, Bur Buret, Lebanon, <laughs> on Friday, October 18th. Lebanon is seeing its largest demonstrations since 2005. Uh, taken by Sam Tarling from the Getty Images. So um, what we can see is that our caption is only two sentences. That first sentence usually tells us the who and what of the photo, and then the second sentence tends to give us a little bit more details and a little bit more context. So keep that in mind with a caption, that that first sentence is the who and the what, and the second one gives more context. So when we're talking about a good spread, even though this is an article that was in um, Austin Monthly, it still shows us that we have a headline, a subhead, and our byline. Um, and sometimes we'll also include the details of maybe when an article was published and the date. Um, but keep in mind that we start with our headline. After the subline, our subline, after the headline, we have the subhead. Um, your headline is pretty short and snappy, but it grabs your reader's attention. The subhead gives more clues about the story, but it's also pretty short. And then our byline is just who the story is by. So while we take a look at the headline, the subhead, um, and the body copy and the lead, we're going to look at this spread from Legacy High School. Legacy is definitely one of our inspiration schools uh, when we look at their yearbook. They always tend to be very impressive. And um, so we're going to take a look at this one. The headline is Roll with the Red. Okay. It starts with four words only. Um, there's a lot of R, so we kind of have that nice repetition of the R in there. And it also describes the content well without giving away too much. So clearly, um, Maybe something about their school has to do with red. Roll with the red would definitely mean something to the students who are, who are actually there at that school. The subhead right here is providing slightly more information, but again, not very specific, enough to get that reader's attention and making them want to read a little bit more. Their subhead is organizations decorate wagons as new tradition. So clearly there's organizations that are doing something, they're decorating wagons, and this has become um, maybe like a prideful thing, a new tradition at their school. So it still leaves the reader with questions, but also questions not in a bad way, questions of, I want to know more about this story. Um, things like your dominant photo and your captions are also going to help tell that story too. The lead is this first paragraph that we see right here. It paints a picture for the reader. It also puts the reader in the middle of the action. Um, most really good leads tend to place the reader in the story without giving away um, super specific details. We don't see the who, what, where, when, why, or how just yet. That tends to happen in the paragraph after it, but um, this first paragraph really kind of reels you into the story. Body copy um, is just text, okay? It's different than captions because it should include the story and details. We also tend to see a transition between quote details, quote details, um, AKA, not this extra K, <laughs> it's the inverted pyramid. And as far as design, the body copy fills in the white space and provides a contrast to all of these pictures that we see in here as well. If we had all these pictures, that'd be great, but think of all the white space that you would have in here without the extra text to help you understand what's going on in the photos. Our dominant photo is the biggest photo on the spread and it grabs the reader's attention. It's usually the best picture of the event. Um, that should always be used as the dominant. So clearly this was the best picture they found of the event. I mean, but it does um, make sense with the headline, roll 
their wheels, they're rolling. Um, organizations decorate wagons. They have a wagon right here, and this might be maybe some girls that are part of an organization. So it really makes sense with the headline and the subhead. It's a perfect dominant photo. So this is actually a magazine spread made by my easing kids, but a big thing I try to make sure they do is um, always include a folio on each page of the spread. Whenever you're designing the yearbook, every single spread should have a folio on it. The folio marks what page the reader is on, and it may also include the following, such as the name of the publication, what section you're in, maybe you're on student life, um, and maybe also the publication volume. Um, maybe this is the 50th publication, or the 50th volume, the 50th year that you're publishing this. Um, usually don't see volume too much, but the name of the publication, maybe the section, um, also tends to be on there. Now the gutter space, I've said this a couple times, especially my easing kids, I gotta get this into them, but um, it's definitely the space that is in between the columns of text, okay? Gutter space tends to be one pica, which is 0.1667th of an inch. Um, it also give us, gives us this break in text. So if all of this text were just one big block of copy, That'd be really hard to read. It's really hard to read all the way across and then come back to your second line, read all the way across, come back to your third line. It's easier when we can just break up text like this, read all the way down, and know that we're gonna start back up here. The bleed, okay, this might be a little hard to kind of see, but the bleed is this red line, which kind of helps bleed red, okay? Bleed is the red line that we see when we are working in InDesign and it tells us um, where certain things should hit, okay? Um, certain elements that need to hit off of the page. So if this photo, if you want it to look like it's bleeding off the page, which means it's coming off the page, you would see on here that this photo is coming off of the page, but it's going all the way to the bleed, okay? Now what the bleed does for us is that when the spread is printed, if, for example, um, it's printed slightly, maybe just a little bit off of the page. So this is a page you're working on, but it actually prints a little bit more off of this page. We're not gonna see some little white sliver of line. Um, instead, we're actually still going to see the photo as it's supposed to look, which it looks like it's coming off the page, okay? The bleed goes around the entire spread, by the way, you can see it all the way around. Margins are these purple lines and they tell you that your text needs to stay inside the margins, okay? Um, it's a really hard thing when you're working in preview mode. Um, when you're working in preview mode, you don't see these little guides, these margin guides or the bleed guides. You actually don't see these frames either. Um, instead, you're working a little bit more blindly. I suggest only look at preview mode when you're trying to preview your document when you're ready to print it or when you're ready to be finished with it. But for the most part, you should work in normal mode. That's gonna help you uh, keep your text inside the margins and keep all your graphic elements that you want to bleed off the page. Make sure that they are bleeding to the bleed line. All right, pica is a unit of measurement. Um, I just said this a second ago, but again, it's 0.1667th of an inch, and we round up so that there are six picas in one inch. Um, the guttering columns of text is default to one pica, um, but when you're designing captions like this, you need to keep in mind that you need to keep a pica of space. What's really helpful when working in InDesign is if you hit the buttons Shift and then any of your arrow keys, up, down, left, right, if you hit shift and then up, your text or whatever graphic element you're working with is going to move up one pica. And when you move to the left or the right and you do the shift left, shift right, it's going to move always one pica. So just kind of keep that in mind that whenever we are moving stuff and I'm talking about spacing or we need to see at least a pica of space, you can easily make that change by hitting the shift and the arrow key buttons. Let's talk about the yearbook organization. So deadline, everyone should know what a deadline is, but if you don't know, deadlines are times when the spreads, the caption of photos are due either to the editors, they're due to me, or they're due to our publishers. 
we have internal and external deadlines, and the internal deadlines are ones that are set by the editor-in-chiefs, basically for all editors and staffers to meet, and then external meaning that once our editor-in-chiefs have received those spreads and made any edits to them, and they're ready to be sent off to our publishers, we need to meet deadlines set by our publishers so that um, we're printing on time and that we also aren't running into any money issues either. All right, a spread or a DPS, also known as a double page spread, is a two page document created in InDesign for the designer to lay out the text, the photos, and the graphics for the yearbook. So if you're working in normal mode, this is what you're gonna see in InDesign. Um, for example, I have my headline right here, my dominant photo. I have some frames with um, no photos in them, uh, just to give me an idea of what my layout could look like for this spread. And then some filler text for the captions that I want to use as well. Our style guide. This is set by the editor-in-chief or editor-in-chiefs. It sets the tone for the yearbook and includes the fonts, the sizes, modules, those are example spreads, margins, spacing, boxes, measurements, graphics, how many graphics, your text, how much text, color scheme, and much, much more. Um, if you go into the PowerPoint and you click on this image, it will take you to our style guide for this year. Um, this just happens to be the headline package that we're going to use for different headlines um, in our spreads. And this is what the folio should look like. So that's just an example that um, your style guide is going to show the editors and the staffers what exactly we're looking for when creating our spreads for the year. All right, the latter is a term for the organization of the actual printed yearbook. And the best letters are the ones that include deadlines, editors, and all the staff members. Um, all publications delegate their spreads and their deadlines based on ladders. So the ladder is really the starting place. Um, and then when you're getting ready to actually begin your school year, you're pretty much finalized with your ladder so you can start working off of deadlines. For example, we are currently working on deadline two. Um, I pulled up the ladder on here just in case you haven't seen it in a while. But um, here's deadline two. It's a little bit bigger than our deadline one. And then the entire book itself, you can look at the entire ladder. Um, and this is going to be the whole yearbook. And you can see what pages are on which deadline. So our yearbook is 300 pages. It's pretty large. And it's divided up into all these sections, which we're about to talk about next. Okay. So it's divided into these different sections. Some of the big, big sections we tend to see are theme pages, um, student life pages, sports, academics, reference profiles, ads, and there's more as well. As you notice, our staff is made up of editors who each in turn get different staffers to help them with these specific um, pages. So let's talk about the index. This is part of the yearbook. It's usually in the back and it lists the students' names and what pages they are on. While this section may not seem super important, it is extremely important. For example, when you first get your yearbook, yes, it's pretty to, it's fun to look through the pretty pages, but um, most kids are also rushing to the back of the yearbook to try to see what pages they are on. So it lists all the students' names and then what pages they are on. Now, this can take some time in yearbook to do. Um, it does take a lot of time, especially when we're getting towards the end and we're getting ready to publish our yearbook. Uh, but it's super important to make sure we have every student's name and then what pages they are listed on. A yearbook divider is also part of these theme pages and they help the reader by separating the book into different sections. Um, if we take a look at D1, for example, um, we can see that we had one, two, three dividers already. So those were dividers that um, needed to be designed. They basically help to break up the different sections of the yearbook. Mugs, okay, a mug shot is a thumbnail size picture of a person. Mugs are seen in the panel section. Um, panels take a very long time to tend to, um, to create because I have to make sure every single person gets in there and that you have their names correct as well. Um, as well, now we're seeing a lot more design with panels as well. We don't just see these individual images of students, but we might also see a little story about a student who is in that grade um, that could represent that grade level well. 
We also see mugs in newspaper columns. If you ever read something like Dear Abby, um, you might see an image of a woman um, who's being Abby, and uh, that would be a mug shot of that person. Now, mugs are important because they're cataloging each student at school. Um, I've definitely had parents email me before saying, my student isn't in the yearbook. Um, and then we'd have to go back and check their mugs and make sure that we actually do see a student in there. It's really important not only for parents, but students want to make sure that they're represented in their school as well. So let's move into the reference section. Kind of like the panel section, this allows us to categorize and catalog our clubs and organizations. Sometimes these sections may be the only place that a student is uh, listed, so it's really, really important to include them. So for example, we might see this girl right here only on this page and in this section right here, but maybe we don't see her anywhere else in the yearbook. So it's really important to include all the clubs and organizations because our students are super involved, but maybe we don't see them at all of the football games and the pep rallies. Maybe we actually just see them participating in the clubs that they're interested in. So that's why we include clubs. Let's talk about theme pages. And this is pretty important because really our theme needs to be carried out throughout the entire yearbook, on the cover, on the divider, on the theme pages, everywhere in the yearbook, we should see a consistent theme, all right? Um, we're gonna take a look at this example. This is um, what you don't know could fill a book. Honestly, love the headline of it. And it's big and it's bold and the colors are big and bold. And you might not like it and that's totally fine. But I think it's a very bold and different choice. Something we usually don't see in books. Okay, But we're going to take a look at how they carried out the theme throughout this entire book. So this uh, left, it shows the cover in a very smaller image. It's actually right here. This is exactly what was on the cover. What you don't know about and the cover is what you don't know could fill a book. So what you don't know about. So we still see those lines that are breaking up text. We see the different fonts. We see the different colors. And then this pink and the blue is seen in the headline package right here, the pink and the blue, okay? We also see the blue throughout this entire spread and the pink with our little subheads that we have on top of each caption on here. And then we take a look at this page, and this one definitely deviates from the cover. We see this blue and this purple in there. See the blue and the purple right there. Um, and then right here in a very small little image, we actually do see the cover. So we're still seeing the theme and the color scheme throughout the entire book. Um, it's just paired a little bit differently. The pink and the blue right here are seen on this page, but this blue and this purple are seen on this one. Now, I will say this part right here looks too much like a watermelon to me. I'm not crazy about it. It's also a little too bright. Um, the colors are a little much right here, but it does um, follow their style their style guide, their theme really well. This pink line and the don't is seen right here with our athletes. Um, and then again, we see the color and the subheads in the blue, or sorry, in the blue, and the green um, in here as well. So basically, this book did a great job of being very consistent with their theme throughout the entire book. And, and that's something that um, not only judges and critiques of yearbook are looking for, but it's something that our students can easily recognize and see like this is a theme in the yearbook instead of asking, well, what is the theme? What is the theme of this year? They can clearly see this one. So let's talk about interviewing and copy terms. All right, so this is gonna be pretty easy because this is stuff you do all the time when you're interviewing people for captions. So a direct quote comes from the primary source's mouth. It's not paraphrase, sorry. And only slight things may be changed in the quote, uh, like inserting a word so it makes a little bit more sense, or removing those interjections that we always tend to use, words like uh, er, or like. Um, so if we look at this quote right here, we have the quotation marks and then person said. We should always use this kind of attribution where we quote, have the quote, comma, quotation marks, person said, and that person has already been introduced up here. 
Now, yes, this does come from a feature story, but it still needs to be seen in yearbook. Person said. An indirect quote is a little bit different. These are paraphrased, but you cannot change the meaning of the quote. You're just not going to use quotations. It's not a direct quote. So for example, um, <clears throat> we want to recognize this important date in history and turn it into a respectful um, commemoration of the life and legacy of President Kennedy. Dallas's Democratic Mayor Mike Rawlings said, we want to honor him to show that Dallas really did love him at that time and more importantly has grown to respect his leadership. That is a direct quote, but right here, it's a significant gesture, say local historians. That's definitely an indirect quote, okay? No actual quotation marks, no person said. It's very indirect, but it is still a quote. A photo credit. Now, a photo credit needs to be given for every photo that is in the yearbook. And this is why, uh, at least one reason why we label photos in our spreads on top of trying to um, have it organized for captions. But your photo credit can be written um, like the following photo by person, photo courtesy of person, or photo provided by person. Um, for example, this photo was taken by Ellen F., so we're going to give her photo credit, photo by Ellen F. All right, your primary source is the person who you should get a quote from, um, especially from the angle you are telling the story. So you need to ask yourself what your story is and who would be in the middle of that action. So. If your story is about this football game and the student who made the touchdown, maybe it was the winning touchdown of the night. Who is going to be your primary source? It's probably going to be this student right here. You're going to want to ask him what's going on, okay? Now, a secondary, secondary source might be someone who is on the sidelines who's cheering on, but are all of these students actually watching the game? I think this kid is right here, maybe that kid, but the rest of them are focusing on this guy right here. So a secondary source is someone who's probably not right in the middle of the action, but who was a participant or a witness to what went on. Okay, and I think that is actually it. I covered primary and secondary in here as well. Okay, so um, go back through this lesson if you have any questions and let me know. But this is everything you're going to need to know for your final. Um, and also, this is going to help you, I think, so much in your book if you don't already know what some of these terms are. All right, great. Have a good one.